we are extremely um, fortunate to have uh, Lobo Hang Kyange and Stephen Nelsis join us for an artist conversation. Uh, because so many artists are working with family and community heritage photos, Julia Paoletti and I very much wanted to engage an artist for the symposium to reflect on their practice. And in particular, we were thrilled when Lobo Hang Kyange agreed because her work explores the possibilities and limits of looking at and through photographs, as well as the tension between the biographical and the performative, all of which are leitmotifs recurring throughout the conference. And even though her works are inspired by specific family and historical contexts, they are also fundamentally a metacritical reflection on photography itself, as when she describes her fascination with how memories are staged in family albums and concludes that photography is more a record of fantasy than truth. And we're very lucky to get her because 2022 is the year of Lebohang. I urge you to check out her beautifully curated website and to look at the news section, just to pick a few events that relate to the conference. Uh, she's created an installation at the home of a sugar trader and his enslaved staff in Bristol for the photo festival. The three channel video installations engage the violence of historical erasure of names and oral traditions. Uh, also in 2022, she's one of three artists representing the South African Department of Arts and Culture at the Venice Biennale. In September, she was uh, unanimously awarded uh, the grand prize for Image Veve for her installation Staging Memories in recognition of its, quote, visual inventiveness, historical rigor, and daring conceptualization. And Dr. Stephen Nelson will also be in conversation with Libel Hang. Stephen is Dean of the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, following an illustrious career in the Department of Art History at UCLA. Stephen Nelson is one of the most innovative scholars working in the field of African art and architecture. His life goal is nothing less than a revision of what Africa means on the continent, in diasporic communities and in the imaginary of the West. In his book, From Cameroon to Paris, Muscum Architecture in and Out of Africa, he traced the reception of an iconic African form, the Bihai House of Northern Cameroon, over 150 years as a means to investigate how architecture is receptive to psychological transference, as he calls it, on the part of its viewers who respond both to the structure and to its previous history of representation. Since then, he's edited some very important books, including Black Modernisms in the Transatlantic World with Huey Copeland and Visualizing Empire, Africa, France, and the Politics of Representation with Dominic Thomas and Rebecca Peabody. Relevant for today, it's important to note that Stephen is a gifted critic. One thinks of his influential essay on the photography of Rotimi Fanai Coyote, Transgressive Transcendence, which appeared in our journal, and is one of the most cited studies of a contemporary diasporic African artist, uh, in which he demonstrates how the artist makes his own Africanist through a hybridized queer and English interpretation of Yoruba cosmology. The essay really stands out for the serious intellectual engagement that he's able to give to individual works, which respects their diverse sources, their contradictions, and aporia. So now I will hand over the event to the capable hands of Stephen Nelson in his conversation with Lobo Hang Kiangi. Good morning, everybody. And um, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Zoe. And I can see you from where I am right now <laughs> in the Columbia Italian Academy Library. I want to thank all of the organizers for putting together this event and making it possible, particularly Zoe and Giulia Pelletti and the teams that helped them in every aspect. And I'm so thrilled to be here with Lebahang this morning. Um, 
it took several villages to put this all together. And here we are, some of us in person and some of us virtually. Good morning, Leba Hang. Hello, how are you? <laughs> doing well. How are you doing? Great. It's lovely to see you again. So um, so what we're gonna do is um put up a PowerPoint of some of Leba Hang's work and um and we'll start talking through it and then we will we will continue after that. And we will also play one of her videos or two of her videos. And um, and we'll have a chance for an audience Q&A at the end. And you can post your questions in the Q&A function on, on, on your Zoom. And so why don't I share my screen and we can start playing and then we'll start talking too. So let me hang. Um, you said when we when we first started talking, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> you said that you don't consider yourself a photographer. <laughs> and I would love to hear you you sort of unpack that for us. What does that mean for you? Um, I mean, I've always loved storytelling. Um, I've always loved what happens with the performance aspect of storytelling. Um, and I suppose that photography to a large degree has um, has allowed for that for me. And that's why I feel like it's it's a space or it's a tool that I use mm -hmm. for, for storytelling. And it's really a tool that I use for um, sort of collective memory. And so that's why I'm like, I don't know, because of how it's related to truth um, and related to fact um, and evidence that I am more comfortable saying I'm a storyteller. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> so talk to us about the construction of your stories, because they're, you know, I, I think of them as photographs, certainly, but they're, they're sets too. And I want to walk into them. I want to, I want to be in there. I mean, I think also in, with my, my background in sort of theater and, um, and poetry and coming from that background as a teenager. Um, I've always really been fascinated with, um, with storytelling, but also with writing, but specifically also with African literature. And so that's, um, and so that comes through in, in how I construct my sets and my work. Um, I mean, my work is very much about family narrative, um, but also as it relates to the South African history um, and my personal identity, um, as a Black South African woman, um, sort of post-apartheid. And to really understand my place in South Africa, it's actually taken a lot of engagement with the generation before me, being my grandmother, my aunts, um, uncles. And so I've gone on a journey really to, to search for, the, for that history, for their history. Um, yes. And, you know, and also with my love for theater and set design, um, that all comes through in how I construct or reconstruct or tell these mm -hmm. stories um, and mm -hmm. place myself within this this narrative. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love that. And um, and what, what what is interesting is and as we go through these, especially her story, which we have on the screen right now, you you're also inhabiting. You're replacing yourself. You're, you're replacing other people with you. And can you can you talk about that move a bit? I mean, so this work that we were just looking at now, um, Gile Falaka, her story, I mean, the work really started with um, a sort of journey of healing. So trying to, to heal through finding um, or going on the same journey that my mother went on. Um, so I started the work about two years after she'd passed away. Um, you know, looking at family albums and realizing that a lot of the clothes that she was wearing when she was in her 20s or 30s were still in the in her wardrobe. And so I then located the exact locations where she'd been photographed um, and um, and basically, you know, tried to imagine her there or or almost be in, in her say in her shoes. And um, because I mean, when she passed on, I was around the same age as what she looked like she was in the photos. Um, and so I wore the same clothes and basically restaged these photographs. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of the work that I do is, yeah. um, is about embodiment as well. Yes.
Can we um, talk a bit about that video? And there, there were sounds, there was no voice, there were phones and umbrellas opening and things like that. And it felt, it felt very fragmented and it felt you know, you, that people were looking into the quotidian, right? Looking into the personal, looking into the individual. Um, what, was, what was going through your mind as you made it and, and after you saw it? I mean, the, the work itself um, speaks very much to the family photo album. I mean, it's um, so I, I'm very drawn to the family photo album as um, as a space for um, for memory, but also as a space for fantasy. And so the video itself um, references um, pop up books. So thinking around the family photo album um, as um, as how you you think about children's books as a space for sight, as a space for children to to sort of choose a character that they are in this book, and so, um, but also I think this idea of this fragmented image um, that the fam that pop up books um, sort of present is what for me the family photo album also allows for it allows for um, these ideal selves that family members present through this narrated story of the family. Um, story. Right. And so how does that, how does that apply to your photographs that, you know, we, we have the animation, but your, your photographs in, in a sense are also fragmented, right? They're, they're collaged, they're, we I mean, see I the construction, the, right? I mean, I think that mm -hmm. for me, it's always been about the construction of memory. So yes. the, you know, I think the, this, the story that fam, that we tell as, um, you know, as we look at family photo albums or family photos, um, and we sort of narrate what had happened or what the day was about, um, and how you know a family photo sort of triggers a memory, but it also allows for an aspect of you to narrate a, a fantasy. You know, um, I think that also with my search for the family narrative over the last um, sort of eight eight years, um, traveling around South Africa, trying to locate my family members in different parts of, of the country. Um, and that's specifically being tied to um, my search for the family name and what the correct sort of family name or the our surname was. Um, you know, also because it was spelled in these three different ways. And so I um, and so I I was interested to find out if that was, you know, just sort of the wrong documentation um, mm -hmm. of, of the family name or if, um, but also because of, you know, the history, the South African history and clan names and praise songs mm -hmm. um, as they relate to our, our surnames, black surnames. Um, mm -hmm. And so this, this journey really, I think, led me to, um, to really thinking around photography in relation to oral histories. And so, mm -hmm. um, 
And so I think the work really, what's, what ties the work together very much has to do with um, the oral history, but also how fragmented a memory is, um, but also how it allows for that performative or the performance aspect, similar to how Black um, like families will narrate their clan name or their, their praise song um, mm -hmm. as it relates to their family history. I love how you how you make that make that transition from the oral and the sonic right um, to the to the visual and um, and and the ways in which that plays with history right. Um, you told me you told me a while back that you thought of history as a resistance, right? And I would love to love to hear how that plays out for you in in your thought and in your work. I mean, I think specifically oral histories, um, mm. you know, as as it relates specifically to, um, or in this case, to um, praise songs, and you know, in so my so along that journey of um, searching for the family name, um, it was also about the the surname, um, but also as it relates to the clan names. Um, so Kanye, which is my surname, means light, and so. Throughout the different bodies of work, I play with this idea of light, and it's like um, mm -hmm. you know, sort of the light and and shadow, and you know, in whichever direction you come from, and specifically with one of the installations that we showed, um, it's ha it has these four inlets that lead you to the centerpiece, which is this light source. So it's like from whichever direction, even if it's built in these four different ways, you still come to the light. Um, and so it's it's these four stories that um, that I collected from four different parts of South Africa, um, and you know, and family members were sort of performing this um, our clan praise our praise songs or, or our clan names, um, but also how that was also how they documented their own history through this praise song, um, which basically narrates the family's history um, as as it pertains to ancestors. Um, and I'm not saying it's not problematic <laughs> because it's also the, the male side of, of the history, you know, it, it, yeah. it is, um, um, so it's only the, the uncle's names, it's only the grandfather's names that, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that are part of that, that praise song, right. um, you know, but it is also a tool of resistance in, in, mm -hmm. in how they use that to also document their own history, but also in how it's not written down, but it's only passed on orally. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But, you know, also because of that, then it allows for this, um, for it to continue. I mean, it, it sort of grows because, mm -hmm. you know, you, mm -hmm. everyone tells it in a different way. I mean, there, right. there's the sort of names and there's the sort of, there's the core structure of it, but, um, but it's fluid. Mm -hmm. And there's always the overlay of the self, right? And so, so if your if your surname means light, mm -hmm. and you're exploring light in your work, then then what we're seeing is a kind of personalization of the formal, right? I mean, also I think mm -hmm. when you even think about the the tool that's being used, being photography, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, and also how that relies on light. I think that right. for me, it's also been a really mm -hmm. interesting journey of um, how I've used photography um, for this personal journey, also for this um, journey of healing, because I mean, the, the work around um, tracing my family lineage really starts yes. with the heart of one of my mother and really wanting to mm -hmm. find my place in the family narrative. Um, and so, you know, and so the the tool, the camera has, you know, even though it's it's linked very much to this history of of violence and surveillance, um, but for me, it's also had the other the other side to it. You know, it's also been right. a journey of healing, um, mm -hmm. and you know, and so I think that for me, that's why, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's why the, the idea of like photography and especially in thinking around it in in terms of South Africa mm -hmm. and its history in South Africa, um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how the older generations of, of photographers, um, mm -hmm. like, um, like was mentioned earlier, Sandu Mufugeng, David Goldblatt, right. and the older generations that really yes. documented um, apartheid, that documented, mm -hmm. um, you know, the sort of day-to-day -day of a very particular period. Um, and so I think that with, with our generation, there's a different, um, 
the tool is used in a, in a really different way. Right. Um, right. And so I think that it's also been that resistance, I think, from my side with um, the images that have come out about Black people versus right. the, the everyday images around South Africa. Right, right. And so so how I, <clears throat> you're making me think of your own um, your own journey with a camera and and how how it is how it is sort of transitioned and morphed in really really fascinating ways and you you told us that that you had first used a camera at 19 and that you were that you relied on the street that and that people were relying on street photographers and photos as events and um and I would love to hear a bit about your early relationship with with the camera and how so sort of thinking about those things the event right the family posing is an event right how it how it plays out in your own in your own transition and in your own development i mean i think that even when i started working with the family photos um mm -hmm. You know, I, my I, so when I was nineteen, I went to the market photo workshop to study photography purely by chance. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want, I don't know if chance is the right way. <laughs> no, Grace, I'm not sure which which word to use exactly. Um, mm -hmm. But I, when I was nine, when I was eighteen, I sort of um, in preparing for um, for going to university the following year and in doing one of the exams, English exams. Um, one of the comprehension tests was basically about. Um, photojournalist so it was titled the life and death of photojournalist Kevin Carter and so that's that was the first time I'd heard of the term photojournalism so this is when I was 18 and so I was like okay I mean I plan to go do journalism the following year and so that really shifted things for me so I came back home I was like oh I think when I when I do journalism I might just major in photojournalism you know um mm -hmm. but I mean, that was it really I said it I was 18 you know that was not really the intention um but when I didn't get into journalism school I then discovered um the market photo workshop and then ended up doing photography um but really with the intention of still going back and going into writing so I've always really been interested in the more investigative work I suppose and um, mm -hmm. the more collective um, histories um, or narration. Mm -hmm. So I ended up staying in photography, but that was never really the intention. And so, you know, I think that's why I have this sort of um, resistance of saying I'm a photographer because I've always <laughs> loved um, mm -hmm. storytelling. And so, um, and I stayed mm -hmm. with it because there was still so much space for all of those interests to come in for, um, for me to still go uh, you know, and, and collect stories from family members and to engage with people and to to still do research. Right. Um, so that's that's basically what my journey has been with photography. Yeah. yeah. And it sounds like that you you also sort of moved from this 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 notion of the photograph as a document, right? And uh, yes. you know, into many other things. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I think also because yeah. mm -hmm. my my only the only photos I'd really had access to were family photos when I started. Right. In school. Right. Um, so I had all of these books um that I'd kept as a child, um, children's books that I'd kept. Um, and then I had my family photo albums. And so uh, you know, and so those were really the two two sort of precious things in terms of books, you know, sort of children's literature and African literature and um, and my family photo albums and so um, and so when I started working with photography, those really became the you know my my references for images, um, but also my references for for literature as well. Um, and so this you know that sort of carries through in in my practice over over the years. Um, and you know also in engaging with family members, also realizing that. Um, you know, that my family never owned a camera. So right, a lot right. of the photos that are in the family photo album um, were taken by street mm -hmm. photographers. Um, mm -hmm. And so there would be like one photographer, let's say in the area that mm -hmm. would be cycling by and you, you know, you'd either stop him and, you know, have a photo taken, but mm -hmm. half the time it would really be an appointment. So he would come on a particular day and you would mm -hmm. pose for that photo in your personal space, being your home mm -hmm. inside or like the garden um, and so a lot of the photos in my family photo albums are, mm -hmm. you know, are taken by this one street photographer. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so that also, I think, in terms of thinking around um, the fact that they wanted to also present themselves in a particular way um, mm -hmm. was also for me what was fascinating about the family right. photo album. And then mm -hmm. also how it's then put together either by the mother or the grandmother. Um, and it mm -hmm. then becomes this, this book, you know, that tells the family <laughs> story. <laughs> <laughs> that's an event that is beautiful and um and it 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 makes me wonder about that that process right putting together the, the kind of dare i say curation um of those things by your mother and your grandmother and the kinds of work that you do um and it, is there a kind of link for you i mean you 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 inhabit your mother Right, and you explore you you explore loss, and and you construct memory and, and loss and and grief. I would imagine, um, but in in the other in the other photos in the in the stage sets, is there it, it, do you do you see an analogy there, um, or what would be the analogy uh, to this sort of putting together of a family album? Um. I mean, I'm probably reconstructing mm -hmm. <laughs> the yeah, yeah. Again, yes. you know. Um, I mean, because also I think even in the process of um, working with the family photos, you know, sort of taking the family, each photo out of the, the plastic mm -hmm. sleeve um, and then scanning it and then yes. um, choosing the same dress as my mother, for example, and then going to the same location and then having my sister telling me to pose in the sort of identical way. And so all of that, I think mm -hmm. also how it allows for, um, there's there's such a communal aspect, I think also in the, mm -hmm. in the process of making each photograph um, in mm -hmm. how perhaps it's my grandmother who's telling me where this photograph had been taken and mm -hmm. then going with my sister there who then has the mm -hmm. original photo. And, mm -hmm. and so that's why I feel like it's really been a, a collective journey of, um, of healing, I think for particularly with that work. Um, yes. But also, I think also recognizing, um, you know, there's also a role that I then also took on, I think, with my sister and playing mother to her. And so this, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, sort of re reenacting my mother is also about sort of, you know, coming into into that, into understanding that I've, I've also become mother, you know, um, through her passing on. But it's also about mm -hmm. this. Um, this dual identity between, you know, who, who mm -hmm. actually passes on when someone passes on. Um, mm -hmm. And also in thinking about, there's a book that I was reading recently that's, um, I think it's by Jack Derrida, um, and he speaks about like a double loss that yeah. um, that takes yeah. place when someone passes away. And so I think mm -hmm. also in, in reading that, I started to think about how this, um, this image um, with the double image of myself and my mother yes. and, you know, it becoming almost one person. Um, mm -hmm. is about that sort of double, um, how, mm -hmm. you know, there's moments where I become the ghost or she becomes the ghost. Um, mm -hmm. But also how the work, as, as, it, as it relates to death, um, also mm -hmm. speaks to the sort of history of, of photography um, and, mm -hmm. um, and how it relates also to like spirituality. And so, um, mm -hmm. so the work, I think, really has all of those, those layers for me. And that's why mm -hmm. I feel like the, the specifically around the family history is um, is a special kind of journey <laughs> it's it's definitely a special kind of journey that also um mm -hmm. also i think in in what um i think zoe was saying earlier about um you know about photography and how or the camera and how it was also linked to um people's spirits or you know right. taking people's spirits i think right. it has all of those um all of those mm -hmm. layers also that um, that come, all of those layers that mm -hmm. come with how I've been um, fortunate to also think through, think, think through my, my practice um, mm -hmm. over the last few years. Yeah, I mean, I, I had not thought about, and stupidly, I had not thought about spirit photography until you just mentioned that. And I, I was thinking, actually, I was thinking about you know, sort of where we are, you know, sort of vis-a-vis -vis our parents. And so, and I'm saying this as someone who no longer has them. And, um, and you think about them every day and where are they now? Where are they now? Are they looking over you? Are they behind you? Are they, and, and you, 
you in those pictures you allow us to to sort of explore those those possibilities and those feelings i mean there's something very emotional about those pictures um that that i think strike any of us who have, who have lost someone or particularly parents and particularly mothers mm -hmm. and um and it's very powerful I mean, I think also the the truth also about about the work, but also about photography is it is about that sort of resisting forgetting, right? So it's also yeah. you know, yeah. I think you know mm -hmm. that you're forgetting how someone looks, how someone's gestures. Um, so you know, and also with making that work, it really it became such a reminder of oh, actually she she would always smile this way, or she'd do you know she'd always you know tilt her head that way, and so. I think it's also that that part of even thinking about the fact that actually photography is really half the time about resisting forgetting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, because you know you're forgetting. You're forgetting how someone mm -hmm. looks every day, um, and especially when they've passed on, it becomes mm -hmm. such a um, how they look is so is so vague. It's it's no longer clear, and so yeah, um, yeah. And I think that's true, especially if you lost parents when you were young. And, and, um, and you, and there's, and, and I think that, you know, you, you, when we were talking earlier, you said something about preserving things forever, that, that in the work, that, that you hold out the possibility of, of I mean, preserving it's, it's, things forever. It's a yes and, and, and a no. I think also yeah. in thinking. You know, the idea of really this fragmented image is, is also that, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's also, mm -hmm. and when you think about the, the installation work, um, you know, also in how I create them, um, almost like um, sort of like these life, um, life-size mm -hmm. cardboard cutout sets um, that, you know, I'm always shifting them um to to eventually create the right the right image um mm. as you know as it relates to the story that i've been told um and then sometimes i perform with these cardboard cutouts mm. um mm. so they almost it almost becomes like a theater piece or like a theater set mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and so i think that also in relation like thinking about um memory i think and fantasy um is always like mm -hmm. interesting, I think, for me because of how mm -hmm. um, because of how also the family photo album is really that you know um, mm -hmm. it's really um, it allows for that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you brought up fantasy, and because you know I, I'm wondering um, about its merging because you 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 your work does something really wonder amongst many wonderful things that it does it it does this incredibly um wonderful sort of merging of history however we want to think about that with fantasy and feeling and and memory and I, i've always thought of memory as something that like basically eats history for lunch and um <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 in that merger something new arises and it's you know it, it it is a kind of um it feels to me and i would love to hear your thoughts on this it feels to me like a, a kind of taking history owning it inhabiting it and making it your own i mean it definitely is that um you know i think the 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 work and me placing myself in the work is 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 really about that you know so it's like with all of these stories that I've connected and a lot of the stories that I work with, um, specifically with the family stories or the family narratives. Um, so I do the, the recordings when I travel and sometimes I'll ask the same questions to different family members um, about the family history. And a lot of the stories that I end up um, working with are stories, the, you know, stories that were collected by this, you know, from many different people. But for mm -hmm. example, they told me about, about how my grandfather moved to, to the city, how he was the first one to move to the city and how they all lived in his house at some, at some point before finding their own homes. And so the stories that I work with most of the time um, are, are the stories that I collected from many different people. And yes. so you know, and then I then obviously imagine these stories that I've that I've collected from them, and so me placing myself in the image is is about also recognizing that I'm 
um, that I'm placing myself in their memory as, as I imagine it. Um, and also because, for example, my grandfather had passed away before I was born. And so I'm imagining him through their stories. Um, mm -hmm. And so I then, you know, embody him and impersonate him through, through their, their stories. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> were these were these the stories that inflected your video yes mm -hmm. um i mean so you know and so i think also with the earlier works because they really yeah. were centered around this journey of um almost looking for a parent <laughs> um on you know through this journey of locating family members um so that's that's why i think the earliest bodies of work are specifically around my mother and my grandfather um, who, I mean, my grandfather had passed away before I was born, but he becomes the, um, the sort of father um, in, in the story. Uh, so I'm almost going on this journey of looking for, for my father, um, who I then find through, through all of these stories that I collect from my family members. Um, mm. And, you know, I only had photos of him um, and he was always in a suit in the photos that I had of him. And so that's why I then wear a suit similar to the one he was always wearing mm -hmm. in the photos. Um, and then restage their memories. Mm -hmm. I think that's amazing. Um, and you know, we we talked a little bit earlier about um, photography as a colonial tool, right? And um, depictions of you know the native, um, and and you 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 beautifully sort of countered with talking about Drum Magazine, right? And and how that and the family album became a tool of self-determination. And um and I and and it it we we talked a little bit about that and the power of photography, right? And so from there, where do you see your work? Sort of, I mean, of, you know, the the obvious answer is right, self-determination, right? Um, but but it, it, if that's part of the context in which your work is flourishing um how does it how does it sort of pl play or wreck or sort of think through these other ways of thinking about photographs i mean so there's two parts mm -hmm. for me i think one of them is really that um even in in you know in sort of theorizing my practice and thinking about um female photographers from the continent and, you know, the question of where are female photographers um, on the continent, how many are, uh, you know, um, existed, and I mean sort of before me, but also um, during, during my time or during my practice, um, that I think that the work in, you know, in not just working with um, these photos that have gone through so many, so many hands being the, um, the uh, you know being the family photo albums for example and the the street photographer who had taken them mm -hmm. and the, the mm -hmm. process of um, them traveling through different parts of the country as my family moved um, and you know sort of me looking at them so many years mm -hmm. later and um, revisiting them and mm -hmm. um, and sort of visiting my family history I think through through the photos. Mm -hmm. um, and or accessing my family history through through the photos or as a starting point, and then working with these photographs, um, and then this idea of like, you know, the the female gaze, but also women, um, females behind behind the lens um, versus in front of the lens, and so I think that mm -hmm. for me that that's um, that that is is something that I'm. I'm sort of thinking through, I think, a lot more right now about where, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. where female photographers really are um, in, in many ways. I mean, it, it sort mm -hmm. of it goes on, I think, for me in terms of how I'm thinking through that. Um, but also, I think, thinking about photography um, as it relates to the person behind the lens, the person in front of the lens, but also how it's also it activates memories and it activates um, narration. Um, so you know, and so for me, that's that's really where where I am, and how all of that becomes um, becomes really a tool of resistance, um, and especially yeah. I think as it relates to mm -hmm. personal narratives and personal archives um, and mm -hmm. personal material, um, but also as it relates to oral histories. Mm -hmm. um, 
as um, versus the sort of more institutional history or national mm -hmm. histories. Um, so yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's a beautiful video. <laughs> Thank you so much. And so it is now my duty to pass the virtual lectern along to Patricia Hayes, chair at the University of Western Cape, who will moderate the roundtable. And thanks again for being here today. <laughs>